My next guest is from Chicago's famed Second City Theater and has been a very, very busy actor since arriving in Hollywood over 20 years ago. His acting credits are off the chart, ranging from comedies to dramas. However, he's probably more familiar as the father in the hit comedy, Smart Guy. He's John Marshall Jones. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Robert. Tell me something. Now, I know you have all kinds of wonderful things happening in your career. Let's start with your acting. You're from second. You're from Chicago, or you? Uh, I was born in Detroit. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, grew my chest hair in Chicago. <laughs> so um, I toured with Second City for several years. Um, graduated from Northwestern University there with a uh, BA in theater. Mm -hmm. And uh, and at a certain point, I just felt like you know I have to go out and run with the big boys, mm -hmm. and I have to see if I'm good enough to do it. And if I'm not, I need to know early so I can figure out something else that <laughs> I'm good enough to do. So, uh, so I came out to Los Angeles, and, um, and things have, have worked out. I've been really fortunate. Talk about some of, the, some of the good roles that you've done. I know you've done. We, we know about Smart Guy, but talk, talk about how you got that role. Because you look so much like the kid. Oh, yeah. Well, um, actually what happened was I had gone on a series of um, of network callbacks. Okay. So um, a lot of the audience might not know, but for the for the television series, it takes somewhere between five and eight auditions. And so I had been to the fifth, sixth, seventh audition mm -hmm. on about four projects in a row and didn't get them. <laughs> so by the time this one came up. In my mind, I had all of the reasons why I wasn't right for it. <laughs> they wanted somebody who was in his mid-50s. I was in my mid-30s. I'm too young. I, you know, I had already made all these ideas in my mind before I got to the audition. Right. So right before the audition, Monica Swan, the casting director, comes out says, it's your turn. I pulled her aside and I said, Monica, listen, <laughs> I'm really not right for this. And I don't want to waste everybody's time. Mm -hmm. So it's okay with me if I don't go in. Mm -hmm. And so she said, well, why don't you just go on in there and read and let them decide. Mm -hmm. So I decided at that point that the stuff that I was reading was not funny. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't going to try and make it funny. I was just going to read it the way that I had said it to my own son, who was about that age and was gifted the way that the smart guy is. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and that was exactly what they were looking for. They didn't want somebody to be funny. They right. just wanted somebody to be dad. Right, right. And then it turned out I had never met Taj Maori. So then it turned out when I saw him, I was like, oh, he, he does look like my son. Yeah. And Amazing. so all of a sudden there was right. this synergy <laughs> that just sort of happened. And, uh, and it turned up to be um, the, you know, really one of the real high points of my career. Right. No, yeah. and your, well, needless to say, your performance was wonderful. But just to see that family thing work between you guys. Well, here's a, um, an interesting thing, too. Um, when I came to Hollywood, as you know, in the 70s and, and early 80s, most of the roles for black actors were negative. It was pimps, pushers, sure. drug dealers, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I came out of that, that era of artists mm -hmm. who you know, were going to uplift the world. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do something that was going to take the image of African Americans around the globe as a positive image. And, um, and that meant that I passed on a lot of stuff that sure. a lot of my contemporaries were doing. Sure. Um, but in the end of it, um, Smart Guy still plays now. It plays, I was over in Paris, it plays in Paris every day. Mm. It plays in uh, all over Europe. It plays in Saudi Arabia, in the Philippines, in Botswana. It plays in Canada. It plays in London. It plays in Australia. Wow. It plays all over the world. So that image of this African-American genius mm -hmm. in a functioning, positive nuclear family with a black father that is an entrepreneur and a business right. owner and is a loving, stable family man. Mm -hmm. That image now has gone all over the oh. world and still plays. Mm -hmm. And I would rather have that as my legacy than to have, 
you know, a multi-million dollar contract in which I got paid, right. but I sent an image out that damaged the work that people before me have done to help African Americans to get to where we are right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not only happy with the smart guy as a piece of work, but the legacy that it creates for African Americans across the globe mm -hmm. is the thing that I'm most proud of. Uh, yeah, and, and, and also your, your, your body of work can only be enhanced by roles like that mm -hmm. and not those other roles. Speaking of those other roles, uh, give me your take just generally on the kind of comedy that we're seeing today on, on, on network television and cable for that matter. Well, <laughs> without calling any names. Okay, here's what I think has happened. Mm -hmm. We went through a period of time where, um, where we called on artists to be socially responsible. So we were trying to uplift the world through art. If you look at um, maybe the pinnacle of it was Stevie Wonder's Songs in the Key of Life, mm -hmm. which really stands alone as, as, in my opinion, the greatest album ever made mm -hmm. because of its technical and musical achievements. and the legacy that it left for everyone who's going to listen to it for the for the rest of history right. it is a masterpiece indeed, indeed. Um, after that the corporations got involved in the creation of art before it was artists creating art and filmmakers or record makers making records mm -hmm. so they could make individual decisions but with the introduction of a corporate structure to all of our art and entertainment, the corporation is not, uh, is, they don't care about being socially responsible. They care about maxing out their price for their shareholders. Right. So what you have to do to max out the price for shareholders is you have to create something that doesn't challenge anybody. Mm -hmm. So now we've gone back to the old stereotypical images that were accepted by America for so long and now they're being replayed as if the 60s and 70s never happened. Right. So they're actually going into the community and they're choosing artists who have the image that they're most comfortable with right. and that image is really an image of kind of pre 1960s. <laughs> it's, um, it's, you know, we had comedians like uh, Pig Feet Markham and mm -hmm. Step and Fetch It mm -hmm. and, and Amos and Andy who, when you put them around a group of black people, they are eccentrics within our community, right, right. but accepted nonetheless. Mm -hmm. However, when you extract them from the community, and isolate them as the representative of what our community is, then it becomes damaging. Yeah. And so what they've been able to do now, the corporation has extracted those eccentric characters from our community again and given them multi-million dollar contracts and put them up as what everybody should aspire to. Right. And, um, and we have you know, certain black television networks that have been just as complicit in that Indeed. as everybody else. Right. So, um, so it becomes even more important for artists who still feel a sense of social responsibility to be prolific in their ability to produce content. Mm -hmm. um, so. No, it's it broken down brilliantly, I think, and uh, thank you for that. Um, talk to us about your, your entrepreneurial kind of uh, um, involvements in the arts. Ah, well, um, my entrepreneurial involvement started um, while I was on vacation in Paris. Mm -hmm. And I went to Roland Garros and, you know, smart guy was on every day. I could not walk from the front of Roland Garros to my seat at the French Open. Then I went to the Louvre and I couldn't walk through the Louvre without kids running up and wanting autographs and you know, mm -hmm. the whole thing. It was really, it was a great experience in that sense. Except for that, the foreign rotation of residual payments had already expired. Mm. So I was brilliantly famous and also <laughs> wasn't making a single dime off of it. 
Yeah. So I had a real epiphany about that. And one was that they're not evil for making a contract that helps them to make the most money possible. Right. Okay. So, and I worked for them under a contract that I agreed to, all of the terms, sure. and these were one of them. Right. However, smart guy was their product. Mm -hmm. And the problem was I didn't have a product. So if I could develop a product that I have ownership of and then take that product and embed it in anything that they rent me to do, that they rent my image for, mm -hmm. then any time that somebody hires me, they actually pay me to advertise my right. product. So I started thinking about, well, what do, what do I really know? And um, unlike the bigger stars who get offered stuff all the time, I'm very, very rarely offered a role. Mm -hmm. I have to audition mm -hmm. for every role that I have. Mm -hmm. And so over time, I've developed a system of auditioning. There's certain things that I do each time to get, my, to get myself ready mm -hmm. to go in and be my best in the room. And so I started to, um, I first started to talk about that. And I went around, I went to, um, to Langara College in Canada, I spoke at Pepperdine University. And as I was talking about it, I realized, you know something, I, I really do know this pretty well. Maybe mm -hmm. I ought to write something about it. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the book, Mastering the Audition. Mm -hmm. And then I took from the, uh, from the talks, Mastering the Audition, I recorded those. Mm -hmm. And we extracted the audio and created the CD that you have this here. This is the CD. Uh, this is the CD, Mastering the Audition, yeah. which I think is a brilliant concept. Thank you. And uh, talk a little bit about uh, what you, what, what, what's on this CD. Well, I mean, a couple of the tricks of the trade, if you will. Sure. Um, first off, the number one thing, when you go around and you talk to casting directors and you ask them, what is the biggest problem that actors have? Casting directors will tell you the biggest problem actors have is that they come in unprepared. Mm -hmm. They're not prepared to handle the pressure. They're not prepared to handle the situation. And you have to ask yourself, out of all of these actors and all these casting directors, do the actors get ready to go in and say, okay, I'm not prepared. Let's start. <laughs> <laughs> you know, of course, the actors think they're prepared, right. but they're not. So what that really says is either nobody has taught them or they have not developed the skills of preparation that are specific to an audition that are different from acting. Mm -hmm. so, um, so what this product does is it gives the actor a system of preparation that he can call on every single time when an audition comes up mm -hmm. so that he can do the same thing so he can be confident about his preparation so that when he walks in the room, not only is he prepared, but he's also confident. Mm. And we know that confidence is contagious. Indeed. If I feel it, you feel right. it. And the whole thing about being in that room is they're going to see 100 people. 95 of them are going to be boring. Mm -hmm. Five of them will be okay. And out of those five, they're going to pick one. Mm -hmm. And generally, the one they're going to pick is the one that makes them feel the best. Mm. It's not the best actor. It's the one that the casting director, the producer, mm -hmm. and the directors feel the best about because they have to go in business with them for however long that project right. is. Right. So you might be the best, but if you're getting on my nerves, I don't want to sit with you for 12 <laughs> right. weeks. Right, right. Okay? right. So, um, so we have developed a system that helps the actor to develop and nurture confidence in himself so that he can go in and be that person that everybody loves mm -hmm. when you're not in the audition. Right, you right. can be yourself. Mastering, that's what this is about. Mastering the audition. And mastering the audition can be, how, do we, how does the actor get something like this? Um, Where does the actor get something like this? You can actually come uh, right to masteringtheaudition.com okay. and you can download the MP3, MP3 from there and also the uh, ebook. But we're also available at uh, Samuel French bookstores in Hollywood and in, uh, in North Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, we're now starting uh, national distribution. And recently, um, a company called Sourcebooks International sent us over a publishing deal. Hmm. So now we're negotiating the publishing deal, and that'll put us... Go to book. 
yeah, that'll put us in, you know, Barnes and Nobles, right Borders, on. what have you. But for right now, the best place to get it is at MasteringTheAudition.com. Right on. I think it's a brilliant concept, and I think any actor, really, any actor, needs to, uh, needs to be a part of that. Now, I'm here's sorry. another interesting thing about this. Sure. We have moved into an entertainment society that receives its entertainment from many different places besides television. And when you go to these conventions like NAPI or whatever, where the television executives are together, mm -hmm. they are scared to death mm. that people are getting their entertainment from someplace besides television and they don't have control over it. Mm -hmm. So now, we all have these devices on our hip. And on our hip, you can receive streaming video, you can receive MP3s. So the new generation of information reception mm -hmm. goes with you where you need to receive your information. Mastering the audition is downloadable to your hip. Oh, okay. So you can take your CD, download it as MP3 files to your cell phone, mm -hmm. to your iPod, mm -hmm. and you can carry it with you so that when you're outside the audition, while other actors are talking to each other, <laughs> you're plugged in, right. listening to your audition coach remind you of the things you need to do when you go in the room to be your very best. Mm -hmm. So it is information that is delivered where the actor needs it most. And to me, that is really the best part about this product is that you are not limited to any particular location where you can study this. So it takes leisure time right. and turns it into productive time, which then allows the actor to take wherever time they have, mm. whatever time that they're not focusing on life, mm. they can now be focusing on growing their career. Well, we're out of time, but I, wanna, I just want to remind the audience that mastering the audition is something I think that is so, so important for actors to, uh, to have. Mm -hmm. to download and whatever. Yeah. Know. So uh, the next time you're here, we'll talk about all the wonderful acting things you're doing, the legitimate theater things you're doing. We're going to be talking to one of your colleagues later about some theater things uh, that uh, you guys have been involved in, but we have to run now. John Marshall Jones, thank you so much, my brother. Robert, thank you. Mm -hmm.